members. Good evening and welcome. Uh, I'm very, very excited about this evening, particularly uh, if I'm honest, because they are three wines that I adore to drink. So I hope that you all have your glasses charged and you are ready to explore the northwest of Italy with me, Anna Spooner, and Mahesh behind the scenes. So hello, Mahesh, and thank you as always for being our sip size and focus on master. Uh, for those of you who've never joined before, welcome. Our sip size sessions are designed to be 45 minutes of fun exploring a theme. So a wine region, a, um, a grape variety as we have tomorrow. And yes, we'll never be able to explore the whole of Northwest Italy in just three wines. But we are going to try our best with a little bit of backstory and then lots of tasting too. Now, uh, <laughs> a couple of things Mahesh has just reminded me. Please do, uh, when you, I've seen so many people in the chat letting us know where they are and what they're drinking, but some of you have hit just uh, hosts and panelists rather than everyone. So it's only myself and Mahesh that can see it. So if you would like to um, share where you are, what you're drinking with your fellow members, please, please, please make sure that you select everyone when you're using the chat. Also, please do use the Q&A for questions. We try and monitor the chat as much as possible, but it's much easier at the end of the session if we can go through the Q&A section uh, and then, then we can hopefully get through as many of your questions as possible. And a quick reminder, I still popped it in the chat earlier, but uh, ideally your white wine should be nice and cold. I've just taken mine out of the fridge. If you are tasting any Barolo this evening, um, any at all, I do strongly recommend that you already have that poured. We'll get to it in about half an hour, but I do recommend a little bit of oxygen. They often take a while to reveal their true beauty. So please get that poured if you haven't done already. Um, now, I have got a presentation. Uh, we're going to go through as many uh, or as much, I should say, of the northwest of Italy as possible. But the eagle eye amongst you may have spotted that the three wines we're tasting tonight are from the Piemont region or Piemonte, I should say, really, the Italian pronunciation. Uh, that is purely because they are fantastic three wines. Um, and as I will talk about in a moment, the other regions tend to be quite small production and do not export as much. So we're drinking wines that are um, more available to, to UK consumers. And I hope that you have got something in your glass and perhaps it's not from the Piemonte. So do let us know. And the other thing I will mention now, but I'm sure I'll mention it again at some point, is tomorrow, if you haven't already signed up, we have got an introduction to Nebbiolo. And Nebbiolo is the grape variety in Barolo, our final wine. So if you feel like I'm a little light on the Nebbiolo conversation this evening, there is a reason. Uh, the reason is that if you want to hear about the grape Nebbiolo and a real deep dive into Barolo, you've got to tune in tomorrow. So you've got to tune on, on sorry, tune in on the 29th of March. So without further ado, I'm going to kick off and I'm just going to show you a quick map of Italy. Uh, anybody who is in the northeast Italy section will hopefully recognize this. Uh, nice and simple. Again, we're going to go north or west Italy this evening. The Piemonte region in the middle there, you can see it's lovely and large. It's actually kind of sprawling. It's not a hugely densely populated um, wine growing region. We will come to that last. So because we're coming to it last, if you would like to start on your white wine or any of your wines for that matter, please don't wait for me. Uh, I'm going to talk about the other regions first. So it's really important that you get tasting. So let's go on to our first. Oh, I, sorry, I should probably say, say the other regions. Uh, we're going to start at the um, Oeste Valley, which I think is spelled with an A here. I would. Um, yes, yeah, sorry. This. There we go. Um, good. So we've got the Oeste Valley. Now, annoyingly, it changes colour. Don't worry. That's where we're heading to first. Uh, after we head to the Oeste Valley or Oeste, uh, we are then going to go to Lombardy, uh, this sort of greeny colour here, and then down to Liguria. That is before we end up in Piemonte, where our final three or our only three wines are from. Um, but I'm going to hopefully spread the love a little bit, even if we're not tasting from all of the places today. So uh, let's start, oh, pardon me. 
I can't see anything there, but uh, Erste Valley or Valle d'Erste or, or just simply Erste. And um, the reason is it depends. You can see it's on, on the edge of France here, this particular region. So actually there's a huge French influence. So Valle d'Erste is, is, um, is what many of the region's French speakers would call it. Um, but if you are Italian, you'd probably just call it Erste. It is the smallest region in Italy for producing wine. It is this beautiful, long, thin, narrow stretch that you can see here. And you can see also that the river, the Dora Batia, um, the river Dora Batia is the main um, formative part of the region. So the, the slopes and the valley slopes, I've got a photo that I'm gonna show you because it's so beautiful. Um, they form the main growing regions here. Now I've already mentioned it's right next to France. For that reason, you might find the labels written in French or Italian here. And it's a hugely Alpine influenced area. I mean, I had to show you this photograph because it actually, it, it blows my mind to, to see that grapes can be produced in this way. The slopes are often terraced. So these amazing hillsides that you can see here, uh, built into the rock almost. And you can also see there's a few other little um, differences, should we say, with the region. So this system here is a sort of pergola. So you're training the vines nice and high and that avoids things like frost. It can be incredibly cold here. We are talking alpine slopes. Uh, not everything is grown in that way, but it does show you a completely um, almost alien type of, type of uh, viticulture if you're not used to it. So uh, I'm just gonna stop the share for a moment and tell you a little bit about the types of wine that are produced here. Um, there are a range of wines. Now I've mentioned the French influence and the Italian influence. In terms of Italian, there are uh, great varieties, Nebbiolo that we're gonna get onto and taste later, Dolcetto that I'm gonna talk about later. And then there's a few lesser known varieties. So in particular, a, a variety called Petit Rouge, Little Red, uh, Fumin or Fuma, depending on your French or Italian. Um, and there are some locals that are really trying to um, revive those particular grape varieties because it's been dominated by co-ops over the past few years. Uh, so you're getting a lot of international varieties. So French varieties, Pinot Noir, Gamay, Syrah, Grenache, Pinot Gris, and Malvoisy from the Savoie, Pinot Blanc, Chardonnay, you name it. Um, and then really interestingly, they also produce Arvine of Switzerland. And I was at the MW uh, Stage 1 seminar last week in Rust, and I tasted my first Arvine from Switzerland. And I can tell you now, it is absolutely delicious. So I haven't tasted an Arvine from Aost. Um, oh, sorry, Aosta, but I, I would like to, based on the Arvine I have from Switzerland this week. Um, and they've also got a bit of a Germanic influence as well from the north, so things like Müller Thurgau from Germany. So a hugely multi, uh, well, a hugely international place for grape growing. But those two particular red grapes, Petit Rouge and the, well, Petit Rouge and Fumin or Fumin are really interesting, and they're certainly on the rise, as well as the Nebbiolo and Dolcetta. Uh, sorry, Dolcetto. Um, so that is a whistle stop tour, <laughs> and I apologize. Um, look out for the wines. The production is minuscule. Um, I've already mentioned it's the smallest growing region, but also a lot of the um, locals drink these, these wines, and you can find them in the sort of alpine ski resorts. So there is a... Um, there is sort of an on trade and you can drink them in hospitality and in restaurants and cafes and bars, but they tend really not to, to stray too far from the region. I spotted somebody in the chat say they have plenty of Oyster wines. Um, I would love to hear what you think of them, why you got into them. Please do write in the chat if they're a favourite of yours. Um, an incredibly special growing, uh, growing area and producing some incredible wines as well. Just gutting that we don't get as many of them in the UK. So I'm going to quickly move on. Um, ah, Mark Temple thinks that Furman, sorry, I'm just going to read this out. Furman originated in, a, in Oesta and is his favourite. That's great, Mark. Um, I hope, yeah, I hope you can tell people a little bit more about what it tastes like as well. I personally have never tried one, so I'd love to hear about it. Um, but not to be confused with Furmint, by the way, members. Fumin and Furmint are two different great varieties. So just watch out. Uh, right, so we're now going to move into the more 
it's still northwest Italy, but we're going to go more central and we are going to go to Lombardy, a beautiful region. Um, again, I think I have a photograph. Lovely. Still incredibly uh, sort of hilly, terraced slopes. Um, but there are some significant differences between Lombardy um, and, well, Oster, but also just arguably some other parts of northwest Italy. First of all, it's Lombardia, if you're Italian. Uh, so we've made it Lombardy. Um, and it's, uh, it's a beautiful part of Italy, but it's also incredibly populous. So uh, huge population. And it was also the sort of force majeure behind the, uh, the entire country's Second World War, post-Second World War economic boom. So it had the, I think I mentioned it in the Northeast Italy session, there was a, um, a real drive and an, an economic and industrial revolution that definitely came from the North and Lombardia was the epicenter of that. So there are some incredibly well-made wines here, um, mainly because the production, you know, everything was done incredibly well. So you had, and I mentioned it in the last session, but you had things like temperature controlled tanks. It sounds so minor, but being able to control your fermentation and not let it get too hot and not let it stop and get too cold and halt all of those things are hugely essential um, and Lombardia was at the forefront of that boom so there are 22 DOCs in Lombardia and five DOCGs we haven't discussed the difference, um, but that G on the end literally is garantita um, and it is a sort of I've done the worst thing possible I was going to show you um as I open my bottles, the difference of the DOC and DOCG, which if you haven't made a complete mess of the Toxua bottles like I have this evening, you should be able to see the difference uh, on, on your bottlenecks. Um, and DOCG is just the sort of slightly more premium. If you were to imagine it as the equivalent of a French uh, crew system or a, um, it's the, the highest part on the pyramid per se. You can get into single vineyards and all that sort of stuff. But in terms of a quality level, DOCG is the step above the DOC. So we've got 22 DOCs and five DOCGs. The sad thing is that those are really, really, really rarely seen on export as well. Again, they drink a lot of it locally. Um, I was lucky enough to be in a Swiss wine bar, Italian Swiss wine bar recently, and got to try some of the most incredible um, Lombardy or Lombardia wines, of which there was a Nebbiolo produced in an Amarone style, so dried on straw mats and then making a really, really intense Nebbiolo. So they do produce these insanely good wines that don't sadly necessarily reach us on the regular. Um, there are some regions, however, in Lombardy that you might recognize. So Lambrusco is one of them. Um, and then Francia Corta. If you haven't tried a Francia Corta before, I think we've still got one for sale on the website at the moment. They're sparkling wines from the region, but they are made in the method traditional or traditional method. So they're made in the same way as Cremont, Carver, uh, Champagne, not in the Prosecco style. So if you haven't tried a Francia Corta before, that's probably, I would argue, Lombardy or Lombardia's most famous export, or certainly it's increasing. And they are well worth a try. So um, if there's one on the website, Mahesh, and you're able to, I'd love it if you could pop it in the chat. But if not, I'll, I'll include it in my follow up tomorrow. Um, the shame about Lombardia is that they have had a bit of an identity crisis. They have really enjoyed blending um, international varieties into the local varieties, which has um, somehow made them sort of a slightly uh, super Tuscan, um, but not quite super Tuscan vibe. So unfortunately, it's it's not, um, I think they're slowly trying to phase those international varieties out. Again, I know in this wine bar, uh, I was in drinking uh, the Vatalina wines, um, Valtellina wine, sorry. There was a lot of Merlot and a lot of uh, Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay. And they sort of, um, it's a shame not to celebrate the international varieties. So if you do see the Lombardy wines and they are international, uh, international varieties, perhaps less interesting, um, but they are certainly enjoyed regularly on the, on the local markets. Uh, but they do make incredible, incredible uh, indigenous variety wines. 
So that's two down, <laughs> two to go. We are going to pop to Liguria, last but not least, before we head to the Piemonte. And uh, we are going to, I wish we were heading to Liguria. The only, <laughs> the only reason I say that is because it is probably, I think somebody said in the chat earlier, they were in the British Riviera. This is pure Italian Riviera heaven um i will quickly again in fact <clears throat> sorry pardon me i'll just explain where it is first so it borders france just here so you can imagine we've got nice um all of those sorts of swanky french riviera uh spots just up the coast you literally hug the coastline up to genoa and then all the way down and then we get down to tuscany so it is quite long and it's quite thin but it is actually Italy's third smallest producing region um and it produces well I'll actually I'll show you first what how hard it is to produce wine here gorgeous I think we can all agree gorgeous um but an incredibly hard uh, Tracy's just said I love the Cinque Terre um tell me about it Tracy uh what a place to visit um some of the most beautiful coastline probably in the world certainly very famous but the grape growing is incredibly tough these are the apennines and they apennines sorry my italian pronunciation i really tried today i've been practicing <laughs> and it's still not going um but the apennines apennines come right down into the edge almost into the sea so instead of having the, a sort of gentle coast where I'm thinking of things like the south of France, where the coast really um, eases its way out into the sea, it's not like that. They are steep. They are hard to produce, uh, hard to produce grapes here, but really hard to just maintain a vineyard. And the holdings are really small. So instead of having big co-ops or, or um, large producers, it's often really small individual farmers and um, dominated by, you know, a few local grape varieties, should we say. So Vermentino is its number one grape variety. It's known here as Pigato. And if you haven't tried Vermentino before, you may have tried it in the south of France where it's called Roll. Um, but chances are you've probably tried it somewhere else in Italy. It's got um, quite a big spread across Italy. Produces beautiful wines. Um, and if you have been to Cinque Terre or anywhere on this coastline, chances are you have dr drunk or tasted a local Pigato Vermentino wine. It's the top white grape. Um, and then in terms of the reds, uh, there's a great variety called Rossese, uh, there's Sangiovese and Dolcetto. And we are going to discuss Dolcetto when we go into the Piemonte section. But Sangiovese um, would be more of a central Italian grape variety. So you can see it's starting to have influences. Uh, you know, it's got grapes that are also grown in the south of France. It's got grapes from central Italy. It's got grapes from northwest Italy. So even though it's a very, very small place, it's got these lovely, um, it's got a lovely selection of grape varieties. Again, a renewed interest in the local grapes, which is absolutely fantastic. And if the holdings and the production weren't so small, I really do think that the wines of uh, Liguria would be incredibly popular in the UK. They are perfect sort of um, seafood and, and easy drinking wines, but really good quality. So if only they made more of them. <laughs> um, and like I said, the third, um, the third smallest region uh, or producing region in France. Um, I've just had somebody say that they actually consider Vermentino and Pigata two separate grape varieties in the Liguria. Um, now, they are the same variety, unfortunately. Um, the Pigato wines tending to be richer, it will probably be a clonal thing. So they might have chosen the, the richer clones. Could also be a production thing um, compared to some of the sim more simple Vermentino that you can find across parts of Italy. But I can confirm, Mark, they are the same grape variety. So um, the locals might say, uh, yeah, the locals might say differently, but they are in fact the same grape variety. So, right, where are we? Okay, it's time to get talking about the Piemonte and start tasting, I think. So here we are, the heartland. There's no two ways to, to describe it. We can't beat around the bush. The absolute heartland of the Northwest of Italy arguably producing some of the finest wine in the whole of Italy. I think there's probably quite a few people on this call this evening who would say, yes, absolutely. Uh, there is no other, there is no other better wine in Italy than Barolo. It's certainly one of the most popular in the UK. 
In terms of the place itself, obviously I mentioned it was quite sprawling. If you just look at the small Oyster uh, Valley and Liguria, this really does stretch over a much larger region. Now, because of that, there are quite a few types of wine that can be produced here. Now, I would have loved, and I don't know whether I'd have got some pushback from members, but Moscato de Asti is one of my absolute favorite wines. I think it's a delight. Um, and Moscato de Asti is produced here. So let's consider that for a moment. It's lovely, refreshing, 5% uh, grapey, scrummy, sparkling wine, right through to 14 and a half, 15% Barolo made from Nebbiolo that can't be drunk for years and years and years until it's ready. Um, and we sort of get everything in between as well. So a lot of styles of wine are produced here. Um, Temperature wise, uh, it's actually very similar. The summer temperatures and the rainfall here, the most similar place to compare it to is actually Bordeaux. They do have some uh, influence from the Mediterranean, but if you imagine that sea's a little bit warmer. So uh, we're not getting the cooling influence that we get from Bordeaux, but here we also do have some altitude. The vines are planted on elevations. And in Northwest Italy, we're talking very high elevations when we're in the Oyster Valley. Um, and again, Liguria, the high elevations I've just showed you. And then strangely in the Piemonte in the middle, it's it's more, I would describe it as rolling. We have these beautiful rolling hills and vines are planted from about 150 to 400 meters. But those slopes make such a difference. Um, I'm just gonna take that down for a moment. But the slopes, um, are essential and it's not necessarily there is obviously the height that's very important but it's the the aspect of the slopes that is crucial almost without fail and I've heard two um, contradictory points on this but my understanding is that um, some of the sites are actually designated to Nebbiolo you are not allowed to to grow anything other than Nebbiolo on some of the absolute best southwest south and south west and east facing sites. So this final grape here from our Barolo that needs this long, long time um, to get to its full ripeness and get those tannins ready to, to produce a quality wine, they are invariably found on the best slopes in the Piemonte regions. The cooler sites, so those facing north, they were planted with things like Dolcetto, which we will talk about, but sadly not taste, or Moscato from the Moscato de Asti, or of course the white grape varieties as well. They're cooler, they're high acid, they don't need as long to ripen. And then Barbera, which is our middle wine for today, is basically planted anywhere in between. That's not a cool site and not a lovely sun-baked south-facing site. So it's sort of you get the range, but actually on each hillside, you can almost imagine you have the Barolo to the, uh, sorry, the Nebbiolo, I shouldn't say Barolo, it doesn't have to be, the Nebbiolo vines to the south, swinging all the way around to the Dolcetto on the north and then everything else in between. Now, we will go into Nebbiolo at the end, but just to give you an idea, um, there are actually 12 DOCGs and DOCs that do use Nebbiolo. So there are plenty in the Piemonte, but it's the Barolo and Barbaresco that we see on the UK market. So they're probably the most famous um, appellation or, or, well, not appellations, but um, certainly the most famous um, designated sites in Piemonte, even though um, they certainly don't make up the largest, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're not the whole story. There's definitely a lot more going on. So let's talk about what's going on. Let's talk firstly about Cortese. Bear with me a moment. Let's talk about this wine. Um, so the region that you may be most familiar with that produces uh, Cortese, the grape, I should be clear, Cortese is the grape variety. The most famous Cortese producing region is Gavi. So this is, and I don't mean to be in any way mean, this is a weekday Gavi. <laughs> This is definitely a Monday night Garvey. So um, it's not from the Garvey region, but using that grape variety. And it's most associated with the southeast part of the country, of the country, sorry, of the region. Southeast of the country, it would be a very warm Cortese. We won't be doing that. Um, no, in southeast Piemonte is where you find a lot more of the Cortese grape variety. Um, and it's been there since about the 17th century. So it's not to be sniffed at. Um, it produces a really lovely, very, very interesting wine. There are nine um, DOCs that can use it. This is actually not a DOC wine. Oh, it is a DOC wine. I've lied to you. But it's the generic Piemonte DOC. So there is a catch-all DOC. I don't know why I didn't think it was. 
at least I haven't ruined the top of this bottle. If you can see that there, it says DOC on the top bit there. Um, and this is a catch-all, a regional appellation, as it were, that represents the whole of the Piemonte region. Um, and these particular grapes um, are from just uh, near Milan, which is lovely. Um, but there are nine DOCs that are allowed to use Cortese, Piemonte being one of them. Um, it's incredible with seafood dishes. Now I showed you the map earlier, I'm just gonna swing back. Yeah, lovely. So just to give you an idea, it's in the Southeast that this is most grown, in particular Alessandria around this region. So you can imagine this is right near the coast. So these wines are almost built to go with seafood dishes. We'll talk about what the others go with in a minute because it's certainly not the same. Um, but it's that we're really, really close to the Mediterranean here, even if there is another entire wine growing region between us. So these are built for um, for seafood. This is a great introduction to Cortese. I really do agree with Sarah. Um, sorry, with well, the Garve grape Cortese. I do agree with Sarah's note on this. It's got all of the things that you would expect. Uh, Cortese can generally be very fruit forward. You can do things like a little bit of oak manipulation. You can do um, lees stirring. This was actually 100% um, in tank and it has had three months on the lees. So you might pick up a tiny bit of a so salty saline thing to go with your fruits, but the majority should really be this apple, pear, lemon. I get a little bit of grapefruit. And I also get something slightly floral, which I think is really lovely. Um, it's just south of Asti. So if you imagine there are a few, so our second wine is actually from Asti, but Moscato to Asti, and there are lots of really sort of uh, famous wines coming from the Asti region. And this is coming from just below there on southwest facing vineyards. So not the most famous area, but certainly good quality. And they're about 250 to 350 meters in elevation. So they keep that amazing freshness. Um, Arnais, there we go. Um, we'll, mo oh, we'll move on to this. But actually, bear with me a second. Uh, I thought I had a picture, but annoyingly, I don't have one. Um, I apologize. If I find it, I'll send it to you. Um, but these rolling hills are really gorgeous around here. So if you are tasting along, have a sip. Hopefully you will feel the lees stirring. You should get a bit of texture, but it won't be oaky. It should be refreshing. It should be light. It should be delicious. So have a little taste. Yeah, I want to be having some fresh seafood with that. I actually think it would be really lovely with the salad. Oh, it's lovely and refreshing. Lots of gorgeous salivation going on in my mouth. Um, but yeah, seafood or, or a salad. Um, and I'm thinking almost like a goat's cheese salad. There's a lovely herbaceous note to that wine. Um, right. I will quickly whiz through our niece because I've just seen the time. Um, but our niece is another white grape that's particularly popular in the region. It used to be blended to soften the Nebbiolo grapes. It used to often be blended in Barolo. Um, it's low yielding, so it doesn't produce a huge amount of fruit. Um, it can be quite subtle. Um, modern, modern winemaking, pardon me, um, has been quite helpful for this grape variety because it doesn't have a huge amount of natural acidity. So the last grape, this lovely um, Cortese grape we've had, very refreshing. Our nace can be incredibly interesting but because of that low acidity has been a little bit naughty and a bit challenging, uh, but winemakers are sort of working out what to do with it. So if you do get a chance to try our nace, um, then please do give it a go. Um, just don't expect a kind of racy wine. Um, and it's certainly better unoaked and drunk young as well. Right. We're back in the Piemont, but now we are moving up towards the region of Asti that I have just mentioned. And we're going to talk about the Barbera grape variety. Um, oh, somebody's drinking an Arnais. Lovely, from Rero, the perfect place. There isn't a better place to drink Arnais from, so well done you. Uh, but let's move on to our Barbera. Now, uh, Barbera da Asti <clears throat> means Barbera from Asti. So I've just shown you where Asti is on the map. And it is the same place where Moscato da Asti comes from. It's probably the most important town in uh, Alba and Asti are the two main towns, I would argue, for, for viticulture in the Piemonte region. 
Barbera is an absolutely smashing grape variety. Um, there are a few reasons, but one of them, and it sounds so silly, it goes with tomato sauce. Uh, very few, uh, very few grapes do, and it makes pairing Italian food such a challenge. Um, but Barbera is brilliant. It ripens just before Nebbiolo, before Dolcetto, um, and I'll talk to you about why that's important in a minute. But it ripens before Nebbiolo. So it's a little bit easier to work with as well. It has naturally high acidity. So even if you pick it when it's really, really ripe, it retains this incredible acidity. And for that reason, it's popular in uh, a lot of new world countries where they're struggling with heat at the moment. So California is growing some, Australia, Argentina, they're all trying Barbera because it has this incredible um, tendency to keep freshness. Um, once upon a time, it was known as the people's wine of the Piemonte, which I thought is, um, is just so lovely. And I can completely understand why. This is the, this is the wine that you want after a hard day's work in the vineyards. Uh, you don't want to sittle down, sittle? <laughs> set down, sit down or settle down and relax with a Barolo. A Barolo is a thinking man's wine. The people's wine of the Piemonte, I can totally understand why it's Barbera. Um, it's quite versatile. It's got um, quite good yields. And whilst it doesn't produce perhaps the sort of super, super wines, it does certainly still produce quality grapes that are suitable for oak aging. So um, in the 80s and 90s, it was making really refreshing wine, lovely, lovely. But about in the mid 90s, about the same time that the Super Tuscans were really gaining traction, a lot of people in the region started saying, hold on, if I start putting my barbe my barbe <laughs> Barbera into oak, what happens? Now, this is a high acid, but generally quite a low tannin grape variety. So if you put new oak, then you can add some spice, first of all, from the flavor of the oak, but you can also actually add a kind of tannin. Um, it's not quite the same as a grape tannin. It's slightly different tannin you get from oak, but it really does work. Um, and it sort of bumps up uh, the gap, perhaps, where there weren't uh, tannins naturally occurring in the grape. It also has um, a tendency to go to produce reductive wines. So what that means is it produces wines that are not... Um, uh, well, to put it simply, they're not sort of behaving with oxygen in a way that makes them oxidized and open in a really nice way. They go reductive, they go very closed, really reductive wines can sometimes smell a little bit like um, struck match, um, but effectively it kind of closes the wines up if in a bad way. You can get good reduction, but bad reduction closes it up. So having that oxygen and using kind of new large oak barrels really opens up and allows the fruit to shine. Now, what I've just described is kind of a revolution of the past, let's say, 30 years of, of this grape. So there isn't really a universal style. You can get very cheap and cheerful that's almost not touched right through to wines that are so um, beautifully handled that they actually need to be aged in the cellar, almost producing a wine of a Barolo-esque style. Now, it's never going to be the same. Barolo is completely different in terms of the structure of the grape itself but you actually can produce age-worthy versions and you can kind of produce everything in the middle as well. So let's talk about this wine. Well, I love Sarah's description, a medium bodied marvel. I couldn't agree more. Uh, you may notice that this one in Wine Champs last year, now Wine Champions is done completely blind and it would have just been thrown into the reds of Italy. So if a seven pound 75 um, wine wins in the reds of Italy category, you know you're onto a bit of a winner. Um, it's a special blend made for us. Um, it's uh, made for us by Carlo Manera and Leda, and it's aged in uh, bot, so big oak barrels, no barriques, so none of the small barrels, just the big ones. And it's got this sort of really fruity, but it has that kind of sweet, it's got sweet spice. And I think that's actually more coming from the grape variety than it is the barrel. I don't think the barrel's imparting flavor, um, but it is allowing that fruit to shine. It's really cherry, plum, strawberry. There's so many fruits going on in here. Um, and it's grown on the hills, really good site selection. And we're incredibly um, pleased, should we say, with this wine. Um, in Dira's asked, there's um, Slovenian and French oak barrels used, it says. How does this work? Very simply, um, you can literally age some of it in one French barrel and one of it in a Slovenian barrel and you blend the two together. 
So it's as simple as that. Um, but it's worth just mentioning that those Slovenian barrels are very popular in the large size. So the bots, I think they're 500 litre bots in Piemonte. Piemonte. They change depending on the region. But we're talking big, big size. So Slovenian and French oak barrels will ha have a different grain. So they will behave slightly differently. But because these aren't loads of new barrels, we're not expecting to get loads of different flavours. But if we were, then it would be really important that it's Slovenian and French. Um, I will come back to the other questions in the Q&A in a minute. Just thought I would um, answer that one as we were going along. So I'm conscious of time. Let's have a taste. Um, and let's let's see uh, what flavours we can get from this. I'm hoping you're all just going to find it fruity, delicious, charming and ridiculously good value. Um, I have a sneaky suspicion it might fly off the shelves after this tasting, but let's see. Uh, so let's have a taste. I mean, it's it's just good fun and good quality. Do you see um, the high acid is really, really evident. It's juicy, it's mouthwatering, it's fruity. And then definitely when we compare it with the Barolo in the moment, in a moment, if you are tasting the two, but it's got a slightly different type of tannin for me. I'm feeling the tannin all on the roof of my mouth. Some tannin you can really feel in your gums, on your teeth, in the sides of your, in the sides of your cheeks. For me here, this is really beautifully coating the roof of my mouth, but it's definitely not a tannic wine. It's really friendly. It's really juicy. Um, and it's really ripe. And it is designed to be drunk now. It says here 2023. Yeah, I would, I would drink this really, um, you know, this summer. And I think it's a good summer red wine. A brilliant barbecue wine. Absolutely brilliant. Um, yeah, marzipan, I know what you're meaning. Um, it's got this kind of like sweet, fruity, um, almost confected, um, confected flavour. Yeah, Indira, I agree. It's not, you shouldn't be finding it tannic or overtly tannic. That's the point. This is a great variety that has barely any tannins. It's all about the acid. The tannins have, a tiny bit of tannin has come from the oak, but it's certainly not supposed to be tannic. Um, we've got a bit of an issue with the wine society and it's in debate at the moment, but full bodied, um, is to do with the alcohol. So you'll see on here wine characteristics, full bodied, and that because, is because it is a high alcohol wine. But in, in my head, this is not a full bodied wine. This is a refreshing light style of wine. We're about to get onto the full bodied wine. <laughs> so if you're not sure what a full bodied wine tastes like, just open yourself a, a nice young Barolo. Um, but yeah, absolutely. This is a crowd pleaser. This is a refreshing wine. This is definitely something you could pull out um, at a summer barbecue, but equally at the same time, with pasta or pizza in the middle of the week, it kind of does a bit of everything. And I'm really glad to see lots of Barbera fans on the chat. I hope, I hope if you weren't, that I might have converted you uh, to the beauty and the pleasure that is Barbera. I mentioned I was going to talk about another grape, Dolcetto. Um, now, Dolcetto is uh, not to be, yeah, don't confuse it. it. It does sort of mean little sweet one, but that's actually more to do with how the grape tastes, not to do with the wine that it makes, because it ripens early. So it gets its sugar levels early. It is deep colored. It is low in acid. So um, it's almost the opposite to Barbera. You shouldn't think about them as two opposites, but it's one way to think about it. It's really low in acid. And it's actually a problem that producers have trying to keep the acidity because it does ripen early. So if you've got a really warm season, uh, you might be able to pick, pick nice and early. And the reason when I said I was going to mention this, the reason this is so important is because if you are a Barolo producer, you have basically three years until your wines can reach the market because of the rules around aging. You might also make a Moscato de Asti with your white grapes, but what are you going to do when you need your cash flow? What are you going to sell to keep cash coming in the door year in, year out, regardless of, of vintage variation to an extent? And a lot of producers in Barolo might have a Barbera, but they're also really likely to have a Dolcetto. It keeps the money coming in when, you're, when your beautiful, incredible year for Barolo is sat there unable to make you money or, or you're selling an Empremer or, or you know, the complicated life. Your Dolcetto gets the bucks coming in faster. So it's really important in the Alba and Asti towns and around those, particularly 
with producers who also make Barolo. But also there's a lovely little um, appellation called Dogliani, which make, makes amazing dolcetto. And I have to say those wines are um, really worth seeking out if you're interested to try dolcetto, in my personal opinion, at its best. So we've skirted around it. Um, I've mentioned already, I'm not going to dwell on it too much, but it is the king of uh, the king of wines, king of grapes, Nebbiolo, which produces Barolo, amongst other things in the region. Um, just before we go on to it, I want, if you've got both wines, I do want you to take a look at them. And annoyingly, I, it's almost impossible for you to do this, uh, for me to do this on camera. But if you have got them side by side, you will see that um, put them against a white surface if you can, but you will see that Bar Barbera has this sort of lovely, almost purple color to it. And it's got quite a rich hue. Um, <laughs> sorry, Nebbiolo is one of the most misleading grape varieties. And last week at, um, we had a, a, several exams, but we had a mock exam at the Master of Wine Year One seminar in Austria. And they pre-pour all of the wines. And uh, there were three wines that were pale and red. And I saw them and they had different age levels. You could see it. One was rusty red, one was slightly brown, um, but they were all very pale. And I sat there thinking, they're gonna be Pinot Noir. And almost Nebbiolo, you have to rip up the rule book. Um, Nebbiolo is one of the lightest color red wines. And normally everything I've ever said would be true, which is that you uh, all of the color and all of the tannins comes from the skins. And so if you've got a light color, you tend to have light tannins. Nebbiolo ruins that rule. So it is still very high acid like Pinot Noir, but it is very, very high tannins. And because of it, almost all wines from Nebbiolo grape variety need time. Now, tomorrow we're doing three different types of Nebbiolo. So do join in if you'd like to, but we're doing one from the Lange region. So from the Lange Hills, uh, we're doing one from uh, Barbaresco and then we're doing one from Barolo. And the most famous and most expensive is Barolo, um, but arguably Barbaresco is nipping at its heels, producing a very, very slightly different style, um, but certainly uh, Barolo is the most famous. So uh, I will quickly just show you again on the map. I should have mentioned as well, Piemonte means foot of the mountains. So I did mention earlier, it's more rolling hills, the mountainous of which it's surrounded on two, arguably three sides. Um, this is foot of the mountains. Um, and Barolo, I have got a picture, <sighs> has these amazing fogs that come in. Nebbiolo actually translates as fog. So the grape variety even echoes where it's produced. Um, but there are... I won't go into too much detail because I want to save loads of stuff for tomorrow, but there's two major so soil types um, in Barolo. And there's these calcareous miles at La Mora and Barolo, and they make these fruity, aromatic expressions. Um, and then three other sections to the east have a more sandstone uh, soil that need time. But what is universally true about Barolo is they all need time, just to varying degrees. Um, they are not... Uh, they are not wines that you can drink quickly or easily like Barbera, like Dolcetto. And that is why you need those grapes to keep the money coming in. I think I've just seen. Yeah, somebody said it's like an old brick red. Absolutely. It goes brownie. It goes ready. Brick red, terracotta red. They're often words I use to describe Barolo. It has this very orange tinge to it compared to other grape varieties. Um, so let's have a smell before, actually, sorry, I'll get the, I'll get the wine up. So this is the um, exhibition Barolo. Let's have a smell. The reason I asked to pour this early as well, um, a lot of people in my, in my exam last week actually got it wrong, um, the quality levels, because <clears throat> Barolo takes quite a while to open up in the glass. Yeah, it, ideally, if you're serving a Barolo, you want to decant it if you can, pre-pouring in a glass is just as good. So um, during my exam, I actually waited and came to the Barolos last because I worked out it was Barolo from the tannins. And I thought, mm, I'm going to give this some time. So I went round my other wines and I came back. And by the time I got back to it an hour later, it had really opened up. And that is essential with this great variety. The sorts of things you could expect in a Barolo, it gets called tar and roses a lot, which I might bang on about a bit tomorrow. But what that really means to me is it has some earthy notes. It has some sort of violet aromatic lift that goes along with the earthy stuff. You can also get some licorice, those sorts of um, 
those sorts of things. But cherry, I often get really, really intense cherry above all other fruit. Um, you do tend to find some oak flavors. Now, again, you have to oak Barolo. The tannins are too intense. You need to age it. But some people use quite high proportions of new oak. So if you are using those high proportions of new oak, you're going to get more sweet spice flavors like cedar, cinnamon. If you're using older oak, then you're just going to be working the tannins, giving it that big oak massage. Um, so let's have a taste and then I'll tell you about the wine because I'm desperate to try it. Mmm. <laughs> um, oh that is a tannin party but do you see and this is why Barolo is really interesting my mouth is watering so much so it has this incredibly high tannin level and the tannins are chalky they're not um big bulky cabernet from napa tannins they're almost like chalk grains in my mouth. These really, really fine tannins, but they coat it. So really high quantity of them, but very, very fine. And then the, the acidity balances because the acidity is so high that my mouth is watering and, and sure enough, the tannins are sort of dissipating with the fruit and the acidity. Um, an incredible wine. It needs food. There's no two ways about it. You have to have to have to have food with Barolo. This is not a sipping wine. You don't order this, you know, by the glass in the pub on a Friday night for a session with some friends. It's not that. This is a fine wine designed for cellar aging. So this will keep, what have we put on the, I mean, I would say this will keep 10 years at least. What's Sarah put? Now till 2030, yeah, and that's probably conservative. And this is a 2016 vintage. They really, really age beautifully. Um, this particular wine made by Sal pardon me, Silvano Bolmida. Um, he uh, went to Alba winemaking school, so a local winemaking school in the 80s to learn his trade. Ten years later, bought some some hectares off, I think his brother-in-law and father, so sort of family vineyards and released his first wine in 2003 um he green harvests so what that means is he snips off um snips off some grapes during the growing season so that the other um grape variety the, the other grapes on the vine can thrive and do better and develop because it ripens really late you harvest nebbiolo up until oct october um in terms of how, how he got the flavors and the skins and extracted the tannins, he fermented it slow and low. So for a long time on those skins. Um, and he had a year in small oak barrels, two years in 3000 liter body, um, and then 14 months in bottle. So he had three different aging uh, stages of this wine. In terms of the food, Barolo is kind of, it uh, mentions here mushrooms or game. Um, the traditional pairing for Barolo is, is black truffles. Um, they often say Barbera goes with the white truffles, Barolo goes with the darker truffles, um, and it does have that rich intense, intensity of flavour. Um, somebody has mentioned that they're surprised in the Q&A that the alcohol level is less in the Barolo than the Barbera. Now, Barolo takes a really long um, ripening period. That's true. But I just mentioned he's doing a few things. So he's chopping off some, some green harvest. He's probably going to be doing some canopy management as well. So managing the, the rows of vines um, and the, the amount of photosynthesis that happens. A lot of attention to detail is, is, is done to keep Barolo less alcoholic because you've already got these huge forces at play. Um, but yes, it is. It's mine's 14 and a half. So they're about the same. Um, yeah, they're, mine are both 14 and a half, my two vintages. Um, but that would that would be normal. Um, but Barolo can reach 15. It can be as low as 13 and a half. But that's really rare. You're more likely to find it between 14, 14 and a half and 15. But remember, you've got all the other power stuff. So, uh, yeah, it can be a bit intense. <laughs> um, so we've tasted the three wines. Um, I really encourage you to keep going back to, to any Barolo that you have. It is a um, it's a wine that will evolve all evening in your glass which is is why people love it so much um david davies has asked do they get less tannic with age i hate to say less tannic um yes 
the, the jury is out on what actually happens to tannins in the bottle. So I am not even going to put my flag in what I believe happens there. But there are some people that say that their tannins actually polymerize um, and group together and drop out in the bottle in the form of sediment. And that's universally across wines. Um, there are some people that, that say different things are going on and we could do a whole session on that. Um, but one thing I think that is true is they certainly become easier for your, your palate. Um, so leaving the science at the door, the experience that I get from an older Barolo is yes, the, they soften, they ease up um, and that kind of dense. And that's how I would describe a young Barolo tannin like this dense. It's sort of, you know, it's small and it's firm and it coats your entire mouth and that is very, very true of young Barolo. And then as it ages, that sort of density does smooth out, soften out, certainly becomes easier. Um, and somebody else has mentioned about um, somebody else has mentioned about 2030 being conservative. And for that reason, you know, if you want those tannins to soften up even more, even more then you need to drink older Barolo because they're not going to be you cannot soften them out, you know, beyond a certain limit when they're this young. Um, John Britton has said, I've never thought of tannins as chalky. How does that work? Um, there are a few ways you can describe tannins, but really the main ones are the description of how they feel versus the quantity of them. So I've said this is high tannins. Um, the Barbera, I would have called low tannins. The level is different. But the ways to describe tannins are usually done um, by a mouth feeling. So you can get things like Chalky would be one. Silky would be another. So Pinot Noir has more silky tannins. Um, Merlot has plush tannins. Um, they're usually, not exclusively, but often the, the easiest terms to use are actually um, are actually tactile items. So velvety, you might hear people say that. Velvet, chalk, grains. Um, I hate the word. Some people say rustic tannins. I don't really know what I means. No one does. What's a rustic tannin? Um, <laughs> But often you'll find that they're actually mouth sensations. And that's not to say that I've put chalk in my mouth and I know what that feels like. But I do know what feeling chalk between my fingers feels like. I know what feeling a piece of velvet or a piece of silk feels like. So you're sort of attributing the sensation in your mouth with something that you can um, that is a, a tacit like feeling. Um, OK. There we go. Silky and velvet, I understand. Chalky is new. There we go. Uh, for me, chalky is, is just the sensation I get in, in a Barolo. Um, it's not silk. That's not silky. Might be when it's older, but at the moment that is not silky to me. It's it's intense and it's dense and it's chalky. Um, so, yes. Right. I'm going to hit the Q&A for the last couple of minutes. Um, Jay Thorpe has asked what would be the food pairing, uh, good food pairing with the Barolo. So I've mentioned... Um, I've mentioned the game and the, well, I actually didn't do enough on game. So I'll come back to that. But mushrooms are a huge win with Barolo. That earthy note brings out a lot of the fruit. So umami foods, really good. Um, so yeah, mushrooms, truffles, really classic. And the Piemonte region is famous for them. So why wouldn't you? Um, I was watching Stanley Tucci's new program. I'm, I'm sure some... Italian fans will have will have watched it as well. Stanley Tucci has the most incredible program on the BBC at the moment, literally explore, exploring um, food and wine in Italy, basically. Um, and they had a dish yesterday, and I was thinking in my head, gosh, that'd be good with Barolo. It was sort of a pheasant stew, um, which, yeah, I think that that kind of gamey meat would be perfect. Um, stews in general, very good, and often they do have quite umami flavours in them, um, so those would be great. Be careful. It's a really intense wine, so uh, but it's not a very sweet wine. Um, I mean that the fruits aren't uh, aren't very fruit forward necessarily. You do get things like the tar and roses, or and when it ages, you get leather. So I wouldn't go down pairing things like dark chocolate, although it seems like it would be a nice indulgent treat. Um, I wouldn't. I'd really steer clear of that and um, save that for your amarones and your your slight residual sugar wines, because um, these are dry, dry, dry wines. Um, so yes, anything with umami, mushrooms, mushroom risotto, truffles, game, particularly pheasant, partridge, those sorts of um, game birds would be great. Um, and then sort of sanglier, or, or again, these are all um, traditional dishes of the region that would be delicious, but certainly heavy foods. Um, and if you can get umami um, or, or slightly bitter or earthy flavors in there, then those are good shouts. 
Um, Indira said, which would be better with steak? The Asti, uh, Barbera Asti or the Barolo? I'd go the Barbera Asti, not because uh, the tannins are not high enough for me for, a, uh, you know, a really meaty steak. But if I was popping a flank steak on the barbecue with some sauces, I'd go for the Barbera. Um, I do like um, Barolo with steak, but for me, there are better, there are better wines, uh, personally. Somebody has said that Barolo is the perfect match for roast roast grouse and i think that is absolutely amazing i couldn't agree more um and then peter i think it's peter has asked that nebbiolo it made an amarone style remark gosh that seems like a lifetime ago that was about 50 minutes ago <laughs> it caught my attention do you remember what the wine was called by any chance i don't for the life of me um i knew that i would struggle oh, I will remember it because I took a photo of it. It was so fantastic. Um, so I will find out for you um, and I will send it in the follow-up email tomorrow because um, it was really delicious. I've never, ever seen it in the UK. I only got to try it in this little wine bar. So, um, oh, somebody's put Sversat. I don't think it was, but actually now that's ringing a bell. Ken, you could be right. That could be it, Sversat. Um, and it was absolutely amazing um but it did have that residual sugar because of the amarone style of winemaking unlike the barolos so they're super 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 dry okie dokes i think i've answered everything in the q and a which is fabulous apologies i haven't got um haven't got super speedy eyes to be able to scroll through the chat um and see if there are any other questions so unfortunately if you did pop your question in the chat today then i apologize um tomorrow's session is uh, for somebody who's just asked, tomorrow's session is Nebbiolo. So we will basically be taking the variety in Barolo and we will be exploring its different facets. We're gonna do the Lange, so we're gonna do the hillsides, sort of lesser slopes, rubbish, it's fantastic. Uh, we're gonna be doing the Lange, we're gonna do Barbaresco, slightly different soils, slightly different winemaking usually as well. And then we're gonna do Barolo, but we're gonna talk intrinsically about the grape variety to start with as well. We're gonna do a real deep dive on what makes Nebbiolo Nebbiolo. Um, because as they say, king of grape of wine of kings, king of wines. I think that's what they say. <laughs> right. Fabulous stuff, team. So thank you all so much. Um, great session. Thank you, Mahesh, again, behind the scenes. It's always an absolute pleasure. And I do hope that you enjoyed joining me on this um, pleasant Monday evening. And I hope that some of you have got some um, got some nice wines to enjoy for the rest of the week. So cheers. And uh, we'll see you hopefully tomorrow. Bye all.